What's up everybody and welcome to another episode of Aaron's Audio Corner. Today I have the Revel F226BE floor standing loudspeaker to review. I don't want to waste a lot of time so let's get to it. The Revel F226BE is a compact three-way floor standing loudspeaker and as you can see right now it does come with the grill which I will pop off now to reveal the components of the three-way system. You have the dual six and a half inch woofers, the single five and a quarter inch mid-range, and the beryllium dome tweeter in a fancy little waveguide. This speaker comes in a variety of colors. As you can see here, I've got the gloss black. It also comes in a gloss white, a metallic silver, and a walnut finish as well. This speaker's woofers and mid-ranges are both made up of deep ceramic composite aluminum cones with cast frames and the tweeter is a beryllium dome with acoustic lens waveguide. This is a ported enclosure with the front mounted port and it features five-way binding posts gold plated on the rear of the speaker. Now these speakers can be bi-amplified. Let's work our way from the top to the bottom. So the top is a one inch beryllium dome tweeter featuring an acoustic lens to help dispersion and also to help its horizontal and vertical alignment with the mid-range dispersion. Then you have the five and a quarter inch mid-range. You'll also note the mid-range features a thinner surround than that of the woofers to help increase the sensitivity. And then you have the dual six and a half inch woofers, again, deep ceramic composite. Now it's worth noting that the deep ceramic composite is said to be used in order to reduce any kind of breakups outside of the crossover bandwidth. And in my testing, I have found that's actually the case. To show you what I mean, Let's flip over to the near field measurements that I've taken before. This image depicts the on axis response at zero degrees. And then below that are the various responses of each of the drive units themselves. So the individual woofers, mid-range, tweeter, and as well as the port. Now let's look at the woofers, the purple and the blue. Typically what you'll find with a poorer speaker being used is some breakup outside of the passband, and the passband means just the crossover region. In this case, the crossover region is around 260 hertz or so, and you can kind of see how the mid-range and the woofers align here. Now keep in mind that these woofers are measured individually. If they were measured together, the two would sum, and you would have 3 dB higher SPL here, and that would put your crossover region somewhere in this portion right here. But we're gonna look past that. Generally what I've seen is some significant breakup from the cone itself and in this case i'm not seeing any of that what what i mean by breakup is would be like a spike or something in in the response profile and i'm not seeing that the same thing goes for the mid-range as it exceeds its crossover point and becomes non-pistonic there is no significant breakup no breakup at all actually that i'm seeing in its response which would typically be in this four to five k hertz region now let's look at the port now the port isn't made of any kind of special material like the mid-range and the mid-woofers are. However, since we're here in this data, I want to also note that a lot of times when I measure speakers and I measure the individual port contribution itself, what I almost always see in port response profiles is resonance. That rears its head in the on-axis as well as the off-axis response, and it also creates additional harmonic distortions. We're not seeing any of that kind of effect here. There's a moderate bump at about 150 hertz, but it's maybe 3 dB or so, but I've seen significantly worse, and I've seen that also significantly worse, higher in frequency. I'm not seeing that. So not only is the port very well tamed, all the drivers are very, very well tamed, even outside of their crossover region, which is important to note because that means that they're not gonna contribute to the sound characteristics of the speaker itself. So what did I hear when I listened to the speaker? Well, to put it in one word, neutrality. And that can easily be observed by the on-axis response. So let's look at that real fast. The on-axis response is measured at about 90 dB at 2.83 volts, one meter. What you can see here is the gray box identifies the plus or minus one and a half dB region. For a speaker to be really good, it generally needs to behave well within this region. Now you can certainly have speakers that are plus or minus one and a half dB on-axis, but terrible off-axis. Fortunately, that's not the case here. Not only is the speaker excellent on axis, it is also excellent off axis. We'll get to that shortly. 
But for now, I want to focus on the on-axis response. And as you can see, it is within the 1.5 dB window throughout its response above approximately 65 hertz or so. What this means to the listener is that the sound that's coming directly to them from the speaker is very neutral. The mid-bass sounds similar in level to the mid-range. The mid-range sounds similar in level to the tweeter. You don't have a heightened bright sense of appeal. You don't have a boomy, overly done bottom end. You don't have a dull or even a warm mid-range. You just have a very, very neutral speaker. Now let's talk about what happens off axis. So as you move around the speaker to the side, you can see that the trend of the response actually follows pretty well to the on axis response, other than what I'm seeing here in the four kilohertz region, as well as the six kilohertz region, which look like some mild resonance. And I do say mild because even though there is some peaking there, it's subdued pretty well. And in the spinorama data, which we'll get to shortly, there's no real evidence of resonance there in that region any longer. The horizontal spectrogram. What this is, is simply a illustration of how wide the SPL pattern is in relation to how you move the speaker on and off axis. So let's say that the black line is your on axis response. So that's lined up with the tweeter. So your ears are in line with the tweeter facing directly at the speaker or it facing directly at you. What happens as you move around the speaker in a radius? Well, as you move around the speaker, you can get to about 60 degrees one way or the other, and you still have relatively the same SPL level as you do when it's firing directly at you. Now that's a good thing. That means that there's less impact to a sweet spot in your listening position. That means that whatever is reflected off your side walls is going to hit those side walls and come back to you. It's going to be the same sound as the sound that's coming directly to you on axis. Those are all really good things because what that means is there is no tonality shift caused by improper reflections hitting you and taking away or adding to in terms of coloration of the speaker. Now let's talk about what happens vertically. If you are again lined up with the speaker with your eyes and ears on axis with the tweeter, what happens as you stand up or if you have a seat that's not quite at the same level as your tweeter and you're maybe slumped down, what happens? Well, another place where this speaker shines is its vertical off axis response. As you can see here, the red level indicates the higher SPL region and it is roughly the same from about plus or minus 80 degrees all the way up to about 10 kilohertz and then once you get past 10 kilohertz you're still at about plus or minus 70 degrees that's a, again another great thing about this speaker so that also means that you don't have to be sitting dead on axis with the tweeter your ears can be a little bit lower or a little bit above the speaker and you're still going to get basically the same response that you would get on axis and the same thing goes as it did for the side reflections in vertical case however in this case it would be the floor and the ceiling so the things that are hitting the floor and the ceiling are coming back to you and they're basically the same thing that you're going to hear in the seated position while you're listening to the direct sound. What this means is there will be very little coloration contributed by the floor end or the ceiling. This all really depends on your specific listening room, but by these guidances, what I'm seeing here is a very excellent speaker objectively. Now what happens when you take all of this data and you roll it up into one big prediction model? This is what we have here. The black line indicates the on-axis response, which you saw earlier. The green line indicates the listening window, which is plus or minus 30 degrees to the side of the speaker, plus or minus 10 degrees above or below the speaker. And that just tells you that if you're not sitting in the prime exact listening spot, how well does the off-axis behavior match the on-axis behavior? And in this case, it's really quite well. That means you and some friends sitting on your couch are all going to have roughly the same tonality heard at each of your listening positions. Now, I should note here, however, all speakers when listening to in stereo are affected by the near side bias. So if you're near one speaker or near another, you're gonna hear that speaker first. You're certainly gonna have some side bias depending on where you are sitting uh, close to the speaker or further away from the speaker. If you were to sit in something like that, like a couch and your friends come over and y'all watch the game or y'all watch a movie or something like that. But tonality wise, you're still hearing the same tonality. And I'll, and I'll mention this as well. When I had these playing in my living room, I sat directly in front of the right speaker. My wife would be sitting on her side, which is the left side of the couch, and that would put her closer to the center position, actually. And to my surprise, while you're watching TV, the way that the Phantom Stereo image is created in contribution with the 
television, it actually kept me from feeling like there was a side bias. So it didn't sound like all the sound was coming from the right speaker that was directly in front of me. It actually sounded like it was coming from the television area. So there's that, that sided cue, but also the contribution of the sidewall reflections helped to make it sound like it wasn't diffuse, like there was no tonality shifts, like the stage wasn't wandering or anything like that. It does a really good job of keeping things pretty focused even when you're sitting off to these sides. Now this data also shows you what happens with the reflections. And primarily I'm gonna focus on the early reflection directivity index, which is just a measure of saying what happens as you have side reflections, vertical reflections versus your listening window. And versus the listening window, what we're seeing here is pretty neutral speaker until you get to about the two to two and a half kilohertz region and there's a bump. Now this bump in directivity just means that no longer is it very wide in all angles. Something has caused the image to, or something has caused the direction pattern to shrink down a little bit. Now what's causing that? Now we can see that pretty easily if we flip back to the normalized vertical spectrogram and boom, here it is. This is typical of any multi-way speaker unless it's a concentric. And what I mean by concentric, I mean like a coaxial type speaker where they are placed on the same plan vertically and horizontally. That means that everything is going, coming out in the same direction, same directivity pattern basically. However, with a speaker like this where you've got a tweeter offset from the mid, then you're gonna have some kind of shift vertically and that's just the sacrifice that you make. But to my ears, there was no issue and as long as you're sitting within about plus or minus 10 degrees vertically, you shouldn't notice any issues either. Other than this, the directivity index is really quite wide up until even about 20 kilohertz. So objectively speaking, it's a really good speaker. Hey, no pun intended. So let's switch over to the harmonic distortion and talk about that just a little bit. That's just to see how the distortion profile trends as you increase the volume. And in this case, what you can see is even at 104 dB, your distortion threshold is still below 3%. That's quite good. I mean, that's, that's hammering on the speaker. And worth noting at this point in time is I was, I'm a bass head. I'm an inner bass head. And I like to turn my music up really, really loud. Um, and usually that presents a problem with smaller speakers, certainly uh, bookshelf type speakers, because what you run into is the mechanical noises. You either run into a, a resonance in the cabinet itself, you run into port noises, you run into passive radiator noises, you run into woofer excursion limits where something is clicking and clacking and popping, or you get tensile lead slap. There's some kind of mechanical noise in almost every speaker that I test. The, the rare exception are speakers with larger woofers. Uh, and in this case, this speaker. I put this speaker to about 105 dB sitting in my listening position 12 to 14 feet away in both my living room as well as my home theater. No crossover, so playing full range. I never heard any kind of resonance, any kind of mechanical noise from this speaker at all. It was completely silent. As far as distortion goes, I never heard anything that was discernible to my ear. Uh, there was never any compression limits where I was increasing the volume, but it didn't sound like I was increasing the volume or there was any kind of gunky, grainy sound to the speaker itself. There was no compression there. Um, this speaker gets very, very loud, does so without a crossover. In some situations, you could probably even use it without a subwoofer. However, if it were me, I would recommend buying a good subwoofer, or maybe a 10 or 12 inch to help get you below the 50 hertz region. And if you wanna go even below 30 hertz, then you might even wanna step up to a good 15 inch subwoofer, that's depending on you. But the objective data shows, as well as the measured response in my room shows, that this speaker starts to roll off below 50 hertz. Now while the speaker is rated at an eight ohm nominal load, it should be noted that it dips down to about four ohms below about maybe 500 hertz or so. And in that case, you're gonna need a, a good two channel amplifier. I would not recommend you use a standard run of the mill uh, AVR. And realistically speaking, if you're spending $7,000 on a pair of speakers like this, you're gonna buy a good two channel amplifier as well. Now, as far as amplifiers that I did use, I used an Adcom, either a GFA 545 or 535, I can't remember, but it's rated at 100 watts per channel at eight ohm. I also used a Crown XLS 1002 that I used for various testing around the house. And then I was also using a Mark Levinson number 5805. Now, I'm not gonna get into how those amplifiers sound with the speaker. I'm not an amp sounds kind of guy, especially when I don't have something to back it up, such as data. 
I will simply say, however, that this speaker did great off of all of those amplifiers. The more power you can feed a speaker, I usually would say the better uh, for a multitude of reasons, which I'm not going to get into right now. If you're looking for a budget two channel amplifier, the Crown XLS 1002 that I used is something you could use as well. However, I would personally recommend you use the XLS 1502. And the reason for that is because it has a higher signal to noise ratio. I think it's either three or six dB higher for the 1502, which with a speaker like this, with a high sensitivity, you're gonna want that little bit of extra signal to noise because that way you're staying out of that hiss area with your amplifier. Now as for placement, since this speaker has a front port, you can actually put it close to a wall. However, I would not advise doing that. Usually doing that results in like a boomier bass and you don't generally want that. The specification, I don't recall what it says. I use these anywhere from one foot out of the wall to three foot out of the wall in both my listening room and my home theater. It's just gonna depend on your room and your room acoustics. Using this with the subwoofer again is certainly gonna help things and I wouldn't set it next to a wall to increase the bass. I would simply just get a external subwoofer so now that I'm out of kind of the objective area, let me talk about more about what I heard. Use all these fancy superlatives and buzzwords that you audiophile types might, might be longing to hear. As I mentioned before, I use this speaker in both my home theater as well as my living room. I actually preferred this speaker in my living room and I can't say for sure why, but I think that it might have something to do with because my home theater has a whole lot of um, acoustic absorption panels on the side walls and I think that in this case, the actual absorption panels may have been a detriment to this speaker. And I say that because the absorption panels absorb the lateral reflections from a speaker. And in my opinion, in my educated guess, I think this speaker is gonna do better when it has a reflection because that will help increase the apparent source width. So the, the sound of the reflection off the side wall actually creates another image on that side wall. Almost like, hey, the voice is here, the voice is here boom, there's your extra width, you know, from the speaker to the wall, that gives you that extra width. Usually that's a problem with most speakers that don't have good directivity control, but as we discussed previously, this speaker has great directivity control, so what's ever reflected off the side wall, you're gonna also hear it coming right at you from the on-axis response. And that culminates in a really good tonality, a really good timbre to this speaker. And you can even, if you wanted to, you could tilt the speaker about 10 to 15 degrees off axis so you could tow it off a little bit, make it firing more toward in the room without a big fault in the tonality. Usually what happens is when you turn a speaker off its primary axis and if it's a bad dispersion speaker, you'll get a lot of reflected sound that is nowhere near what is coming at you directly from the speaker on axis. And that makes the tonality sound weird, the timbre's all messed up and the imaging is messed up as well. But with this speaker, you don't have that effect. The tonality sounds great on and off axis, within reason, of course. And the imaging is really spot on. The images don't sound too large. They don't sound too small. They sound really quite neutral. And again, I think that's all really due to the lateral and the vertical reflections from the speaker being so much matched to the on axis response. Let's talk about dynamics. Dynamics is one of my favorite things in a speaker when the speaker does it well. First of all, dynamics. A lot of audiophiles think that dynamics is just loudness. That is not the case. Dynamics is what happens when you're playing at a level, let's say you're playing at 85 dB, which is kind of typical for most people. And then all of a sudden in the music itself, there is a snare hit and it's plus 15 dB. When you have a very low dynamic system, you may only catch plus six dB of that snare hit. So you're not catching the full sound. So it's almost like it's compressed or clipped. You've got a waveform, it goes up here, but you're chopping it right here. And you're saying, nah, you're done there. With this speaker, it does a very, very good job of allowing you the extra dynamics that you don't normally get. Now that's certainly attributed to the extra sensitivity because most speakers this size and obviously bookshelf speakers are gonna have a lower sensitivity. In my experience, most speakers are in that 84 to 86 dB region for a bookshelf, and then about maybe 86 to 88 for a floor standing, depending on how many uh, speakers are part of it. And then obviously you can get higher than that if you go into pro audio, which I use pro audio speakers in my home theater. But with this speaker having 90 dB sensitivity, that helps you out in the dynamics department. Another aspect of this speaker in regards to the dynamics is the low level dynamics. Now, 
again, most poor speakers don't have a good low level dynamicism to them. So let's say you're listening at conversation volumes, around 70 dB at your listening position, 75 dB, and there's that snare attack, but you don't really hear it. Or there's that kick drum, but you don't really feel it. A lot of the time that's due to dynamics. That's just poor dynamics. So basically the sound is coming out at a certain level and then that dynamic range just isn't there because you don't have that sensitivity that these provide you or maybe you don't have the amplifier power that that dynamic range is needed to have. But again, thanks to these being extra sensitive, you've got that luxury, and which to me is a great thing. And, and here's my side, side topic. So allow me to go off topic for a second. When I listen to speakers, a lot of times I'm having to turn them up to 90 dB just to get that kick drum or get that attack or get something out of it, you know, something that evokes like a visceral image for me. And again, I don't want to, I don't want to equate dynamics to loudness, but unfortunately that's kind of just the way it goes because we're so used to hearing low sensitivity speakers that we feel like we have to crank it up to get dynamics. That's not the case. What you should be able to do is listen to at a normal volume and still have that intensity, that visceral impact. You should be able to have that but you just don't get that. With these speakers, you get that. I could listen at 75 dB just sitting in my living room couch and feel satisfied. I never, I listened to these things, no joke. I watched a YouTube concert, or I watched a concert of Huey Lewis in the News on YouTube. I know, terrible, terrible quality, I don't care. I sat on the couch for about an hour and I enjoyed every minute of that concert watching it through these speakers because I didn't have to turn up the volume to give me that output that I wanted, that dynamicism that I wanted. And therefore, I could listen longer without my ears getting tired. And normally that's not the case. Normally when you're listening to higher output volume speakers, which is needed to get dynamicism, your ears start to get tired in 20 or 30 minutes and you're done. Like you, you're, you're like doing one of these, like, man, I gotta get the earwax out of my ears so I can listen longer, but you can't do it anymore. But luckily with these speakers, you don't have that situation. I, I that was the first thing I noticed about these speakers was the low level dynamicism. I was able to sit and listen to these speakers for a long time without my air, ears ever getting bothered. And the other aspect of it was, is that my kid was asleep. It was bedtime and I didn't have to worry about, you know, disturbing her or keeping her awake. So that's another plus for these speakers. Now I mentioned earlier that this speaker is very, very neutral and that's certainly true. However, what I do want to note is the tweeter. Now this being a beryllium dome tweeter, and in my experience, I maybe am a little bit biased toward beryllium dome tweeters because to me, they've always done really well. The issue I have with standard soft or cloth dome type tweeters is that they sometimes ride that range between bright and dynamic, um, or, or I should say bright and detailed. And a lot of times what you'll find is maybe it's, it's a little bit too bright, but then with other songs, maybe it's detailed. And you're not really sure, hey, is this right or wrong? But you don't really have the luxury of knowing um, unless you do objective measurements and kind of understand what's going on in that region. Now, sometimes it's just a breakup mode around 5K or something from the mid range. And sometimes it is the tweeter itself. You know, it's this little bit peaky around seven to eight kilohertz or something and maybe adds that little bit of detail to it. But with the other songs, it's, it's a little bit sharp or painful. But with these tweeters, that's not the case. These tweeters don't ride a line between bright and detail. These tweeters just do it and they do it right. And what I mean by that is if you hear a cymbal crash, it doesn't make you cringe on some tracks and make you go, well, that's really nice. And other tracks, you hear a cymbal crash, you hear a cymbal crash. That's not only due to the actual neutrality of the tweeter, but I certainly think that it has something to do, again to do with the uh, dynamic range of this speaker due to its sensitivity because beryllium dome tweeters are generally more sensitive than cloth dome tweeters. And usually it's by one or two, maybe even three dB. So that was another thing that I really liked about the speaker as well. Also, another thing I really liked about these tweeters is the air that they had to them uh, on Steve Winwood's Higher Love, which is a track that I'll, I'll always use for my auditioning. The cymbal crash uh, in that track, which I don't know the exact minute second mark, but it actually had almost like a tangible feel to it. And I, I feel really weird using these kind of, you know, these subjective terms, but I don't know how else to, to describe it. But it had, a, it had certainly had the air to it that I like around the symbol. Like you can see the symbol get smashed. You can see the air around it. It was weird. I don't know how to describe it. And, and that sounds really silly, but mm. another thing that I really liked about these speakers was uh, Madonna's Borderline. I'm an 80s nut, sue me. So it starts off with a xylophone. I've, I've been listening to that song since I was a kid. I mean, I've heard that song hundreds of times, maybe thousands, who knows, but so many times. 
on various systems, high end, whatever. Again, it's one of my demo tracks. I, I take it all over the world with me when I world. I take it all over the country when I used to travel for work. The song starts off with a xylophone. When it goes lower, <laughs> silly. But when it goes lower, you can you can hear the percussion of the xylophone. So the xylophone is a percussion instrument. I'm telling you, I've never considered the xylophone a percussion instrument because when I think of percussion, I think of bass. I think of like 300 hertz and below, something that's got some pop to it, you know. Um, but when I listen to it on these speakers, I finally heard the percussion portion of that of that xylophone toward the end of its spectrum, and you could you could hear the weight of it. I've, I mean, I've listened to that song hundreds of times. I mean, hundred, maybe even thousands of times. I've never heard it that good. I don't know what to attribute it to. I'm just telling you that's what I heard and I and I loved it. Now I mentioned the width earlier. Uh, I, I want to kind of cover that just a little bit more. The width that you get from the sound stage of these speakers is practically as wide as the room. So I had it in my living room and then I had it in my upstairs home theater. And in both cases, the image was way, way beyond the actual physical placement of the speakers. I mean, way beyond. In one case in my living room, the left speaker is about five feet from the side wall. And in that case, it went all the way to the side wall. In my home theater, the speakers were about three feet from each wall and it went to each of the side walls easily. Uh, did it expand the, the room itself? No. Do I ever hear a speaker that does? No. Do people say they do? Yeah. Do I believe them? Not really. Uh, as far as depth goes, no issues there. It didn't, nothing jumped out at me though as far as like soundstage depth was really, really deep or, or really, really close. I truly didn't hear anything like that. I think there's only been a few times where I've heard soundstage depth get like crazy deep. Uh, and one time was with some catch speakers and, and I can't remember the others off the top of my head. Now that's not to say that this speaker doesn't have a good stage depth to it. It just doesn't get crazy deep. It doesn't feel like it goes like, you know, 30 feet past me or, or 30 feet past the speakers. It doesn't do that. And it doesn't come out to right here on me. I've heard some speakers do that as well, but I don't think that's a bad thing. It's just something that some people like. Sometimes that can be a little bit gimmicky too. When you start talking about soundstage effects, you kind of got to watch that a little bit. So, But as far as depth goes, that's where that is. Now height, no issues there. Um, it was really neat too because I heard some things as a stage, as things will you know transition from side to side, you could actually tell that the height was moving in small increments, which sometimes will be a phase issue between a mid-range and a tweeter or a mid-bass and a mid-range. And I've gotten really really quite adept to noticing those kind of issues and in this case that wasn't the case because you know I could put on my reference headphones and uh, pick up on that pretty quickly although when you're listening to a, a speaker like this versus headphones that are like that it's kind of hard to pick up on those details but if you're listening for them then you'll notice those and, and in terms of height I think the speaker does a really great great job of, uh, of soundstage height so no complaints from me there and like I said previously the actual dispersion pattern of the speaker in vertical terms <clears throat> is about plus or minus 80 degrees. That is the largest vertical radiation pattern that I've heard or tested even to date. So something, something worth noting there. To wrap this all up, my final recommendation is if you can afford these speakers, absolutely buy them. If I could afford them, I would absolutely buy them. Not only do they sound fantastic, um, but they look fantastic as well. So you can put these in a living room, you can put these in a home theater, you can pretty much put them wherever. The one thing that I also like about them is they're not prone to tipping over. So they're not top heavy at all. I mean, so if you were to actually bump them, you don't have to worry about them falling over or anything like that, which is, is something worth noting because I know that some of you people are, are worried about that kind of thing. The speaker is extremely neutral. It plays all music well. Uh, some people will say that they like a certain speaker because it plays, you know, certain genre of music well. And if it's doing that, then most likely it's not an accurate speaker. This speaker is very, very accurate. It plays all genres well. It will reveal bad things about songs. It will, it will reveal great things about songs as well. It just does a really good job of playing exactly what is on the media. It does a great job with soundstage width does a great job with the soundstage height, does a really good job with the depth. And as I said earlier, if you're listening to music that has content below 50 hertz, you're still gonna to wanna to use a subwoofer with these speakers. They will get down to 50, but below that they start falling off. And when you're talking down to 30 or 40 hertz, they've already rolled off quite a bit. So definitely add a subwoofer if you're gonna play music with content down that low and or use them in a home theater type setting.
So that's going to do it for me. I appreciate you guys watching. I hope you learned something. This was certainly an enlightening experience for me. I've been wanting to test these speakers for a very, very long time. I'm very glad to have had the opportunity to do it. I'm really sad that I'm going to have to send them back. Um, these speakers beat me up. It took me about four days worth of testing to get these tests completely done. I fell off a ladder. I bruised my leg. Let's see here. I threw up my back, literally. Well, one day I couldn't walk. Um, so yeah, it's been fun, but it's, it's, it's been real. Um, it's a really great learning experience for me. And it truly makes me wonder, you know, at this price point, are we, have we pushed the envelope too far, you know, and what, what else can you get? How can something be bested by this? Yeah. If it would play below 50 Hertz, then that would be a solid step in the right direction. But the sensitivity is there. The neutrality is there. The dynamicism is there. I mean, all the things that I love about sound are done in this speaker. So truthfully, I'll, I'm really curious to see as I progress and test other speakers, what's going to make me go, all right, yeah, it's way better than this speaker. Cause I just, I don't know, but with time we'll get there. And uh, again, I appreciate you watching. Make sure you hit the subscribe button, give me a thumbs up or whatever, leave a comment and uh, yeah, that's it. Oh, and share with friends if you don't mind. So you guys take care. I appreciate you watching again. Peace.